Greetings. Hello, good afternoon, good evening. Greetings programmers, welcome wherever you're joining us from. This is Jim McKeith and joining me is the amazing Yilmaz Zoru. He's uh Hello, Jim. Hello. It's Dr. Yilmaz, isn't it? Dr. Yilmaz yes. Zoru? Yes. Yep. I am I have PhD in mechanical, not AI actually. Let's oh, okay. So uh, I will give information in my uh, knowledge. So yeah, I, I should correct yeah. this. That's okay. Still so, you you are you are uh, doing a lot more with uh actively with AI and such, so that is great. I'm gonna share a link in the comments here for the blog post. So today we're talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence. This is a developer's introduction. <clears throat> we're going to link to some existing content we've covered before as well. So uh, there will be possibly some repeats if you see some of our previous webinars on the topic, but a lot of new stuff. Uh, it's uh, actually, a, I want this to be kind of a discussion. We'll be looking at the question log as we go along. And if there are uh, questions or confusion and stuff like that, we will try to address that. Uh, as we're going as well. So do put your questions in here and uh, we will uh, do our best to answer it. So Yilmaz, I'll let you introduce yourself real quick. We've mentioned already you're a PhD, but uh, if you want to talk a little more about yourself. Uh, this is Yilmaz Yuri. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, and founder of Essential Company. We are developing different projects, mostly in C++ applications. And uh, I am a developer since 1988, starting with uh, C++, GB basic, almost uh, basic, etc. And uh, I am MVP of Embarcadero, maybe 10 years, I think, I don't know, about 10 years, maybe. Uh, and we are creating posts uh, with LI and I am also helping us to review in learnc++.org also adding some uh, blog posts in uh, blogsembarcador.com. And uh, I am developing a project, AGI-based uh, AI project, still in development actually. And also we are doing some other activities like teaching innovations to kids, etc. Thank you, welcome also. Uh, real quick about me, I'm Embarcadero Chief Developer Advocate and Engineer, long time software developer, um, I'm sure about almost as long as Yilmaz. Uh, my claim to fame though is I back in 2000 and had a patent for Swipe to Unlock and Pattern Unlock, which I think is pretty cool. I did build a thought controlled drone with Google Glass and a wireless EEG headset, which actually will come become relevant here in a little bit. And uh, yeah. So there's a lot of world politics going on right now, but I think we're going to all put on our developer hats and we're going to talk about declaring some variables and executing some programs and uh, moving on beyond a lot of the other stuff. Honestly, I, I always felt like um, software development technology is kind of its own religion or politics within and of itself. We can certainly have our own <laughs> political wars there and they're a lot less, uh, a lot easier to recover from. So a couple of fundamental things I want to open with is, um, I love this quote. And so this is often attributed to Albert Einstein, but actually I did some more research. And this is the original source I could find it from, is this advances in instrumentation. Computers are incredibly fast, accurate, and stupid. And even as we're talking about artificial intelligence, it really, um, that's as important to remember. And this, this feeds into a number of things uh, related to artificial intelligence especially garbage in, garbage out. And this is what um, artificial intelligence, neural networks, a lot of it comes down to training. And if you have bad training, then you're gonna have bad data. And so a lot of the issues that crop up around uh, machine learning, neural networks producing invalid results are a result of invalid data. And then this all originated with Charles Babbage, on two occasions, I have been asked, pray, Mr. Babbage, if you put in the machine wrong figures, will the right answers come out? I'm not able to rightly comprehend the kind of confusion of ideas that would provoke such a question. Uh, I love this. It, it, this. The idea of machines being smart and intelligent 
has been around forever since uh, 1864, right? And the idea that the machine could outthink the human that's using it. Now, there are ways that they can, um, it re- really comes down to training, right? And just like with humans, right? If, if a human receives bad training their whole life, then they're going to always, they're not going to have any references to make good decisions from. This this also comes up a lot with AI, the Asimov's three laws of robotics. Um, the important takeaway from this is iRobot was written to say the three laws, which eventually added the zeroth law, was insufficient. <laughs> so everybody's like, oh, we could just give AI laws and keep it, make it behave itself. Nope, that was the whole point of the book. It doesn't work that way. And when you get into it more, you discover that's not the case. All right, Yomaz, I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, artificial intelligence refers to the intelligence exhibited by machines capable of carrying out tasks that usually require human intelligence. So this is the part of the computer science, actually. We do a lot of programs, and artificial intelligence is another area of this section. And uh, machine learning uses algorithms to learn from data, find patterns in data, and make predictions about the future events of or any outcomes. And deep learning is a neural network with layers and filters attempts to simulate the behavior of the human brain, uh, allowing it to learn from large amounts of data, or maybe global data like that. And if you look at each of them, they are uh, part of each of other, and they are the subsets of the other. DL is the subset of machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI, AI is a subset of the programming, computer science, and maybe electrical engineering and other departments, not only uh, engineering, maybe maybe psychology or other uh, jobs, other uh, occupations maybe could be included here. Uh, so it's a very big area. So there are many different areas working. Uh, actually, these are the main Works. Your your point you raise really good points that this is um it, it, it it's multidisciplinary right there's lots of different areas coming together for this and then also uh it's one of those things that there's a lot of new uh studies and careers and areas of focus that are coming into play in this yeah a few more Vocabulary, there's always more vocabulary, but I wanted to hit some of the big things I thought we might come up. Uh, specifically, artificial neural networks is the idea. And so this is kind of cool, actually, is when they originally started thinking about artificial intelligence and computer science, they're thinking, what if we modeled the human brain, right, with the neurons and synapses? But then uh, they discovered it, computers weren't fast enough. But now, thanks to GPUs today, computers are now able to be par- – because our brains are massively parallel. Right. And so they're able to do that. Uh, Generative adversarial networks is really cool because what essentially you have is you have two AIs, two neural networks that are training each other. And that is really cool. And so actually this comes in interesting. You probably heard about some of the deep fakes where they're using it to fake like uh, all sorts of stuff, concerns about political news stuff, which was used in Brazil, faking a, a thing for the election in Brazil. But anyway, the they're making detectors for deep fakes. But the thing is, is as they make better detectors, those detectors can train the things that are making the better fakes. So it's a, it's an arms race and there is no, uh, yeah, it, it, the world we live in has fundamentally changed. I thought this would be uh, interesting to look at. This is the emotive EEG headset that I got for when I was doing the thought control drone a few years back and I looked up here and it's now giving me a 3D real-time visualization of what parts of my brain are active. Now the reason I thought this would be interesting is if we zoom in on it here that you can see the um, well you have neurons and synapses in your brain different parts of your brain are active at different times Now, this is not an accurate enough device to actually show which neuron is active within the brain. You would need something um, similar to the uh, 
Elon Musk's Neuralink, where it actually has the electrons in the brain, but where it's showing the parts of the brain that are active and what wavelengths are active. So I can change what wavelengths it's uh, tuned to by coming here and adjusting these sliders down or back up. Let's see, blue, I can turn blue down. There we go. So I can turn that down to see different parts of the brain that are active, or different wavelengths. Um, and there's a thing over here that explains what the different frequencies mean and stuff like that. But, um, so what this is showing is what waves are active in what parts of the brain. But the, the reason I put this on here, I'll put this back on here, it looks like I'm falling asleep. <laughs> there we go. The reason I wanted to show this, though, is because it's the same thing in a neural network. In the neural network, we have the concept of neurons, and they are connected. And so the difference is that uh, with a um, neural network, artificial neural network, you don't have to wear, you know, one of these fancy headsets and have this really conductive haircut. You instead are simulating it in computer hardware, and the brain is orders of magnitude more complex than um, the computer hardware we have today. In theory, better computer hardware, better power, we can reach this level of complexity. In theory, I should be able to like learn to have better control over it. I can't even control the mouse. Relax. Close my eyes would change it too. Anyway, I thought that would be kind of a cool thing to, to look at. It was okay. great. Yeah, so I love this because the idea of using the uh, b building neural network based on the brain like I said, it was original original idea, and now we're actually doing that. And so we're kind of there's a few things happening at once. Is we're simultaneously learning more about the brain, how the brain works, and we're applying that more in computer programming or in artificial intelligence neural networks. So it, it's a it's a, a neat thing. A lot of neat stuff going on right now. I thought about actually wearing the headset through the whole webinar and having the the you guys can see my neural activity, but <laughs> you have very colorful neurons. Yes, yes. So I love this one here. I'll let you, I'll let you explain this to you, Matt, but the, the, the explanation of the different concepts here. Yeah. Um, in artificial general intelligence, there are many areas, but basically uh, there is a very big area, which is mostly unknown still in search. We are trying to at least uh, reach to the human brain. The first step may be reaching to the level of the human brain, understanding, learning, reasoning, and solving everything, doing everything uh, without maybe uh, writing codes like that. So this is the big area in AI technology. And all the other things inside are called AI technologies. And one of the big parts is machine learning. And there are uh, ANN, for example. Perceptron is the basic uh, model of the ANN. And other algorithms, hope fields, and other, uh, or other uh, areas can be counted here. And the other one is uh, the deep learning. Deep learning is multi-layered neural network which is learning from a big data. So it is, it has a very large big data and learning with multi-layered neuron, neural network. At the, in some definition, it says uh, higher than three layers. Uh, I don't know the limit, maybe uh, one layer is enough, but uh, deep learning is <clears throat> also very deep nowadays because uh, we have uh, in humans and technology, improved very faster nowadays. So we have a lot of areas in the deep learning, including uh, speech recognition, face recognition, uh, video analyzing, and many tools. And CNN, uh, NLP may be, and RNN, LSTM, and spiking neural network are kind of these things. And there's a core thing, 
which is called artificial general intelligence. It is also a strong called a strong AI or main AI like that. It is something like a kernel of the AI. So you design something and it learns everything like a baby brain. Uh, if we uh, investigate babies, they are learning by themselves. So there's a core kernel inside. So it is learning with it. If humans uh, uh, discover this, find this, then we don't need to program more about image recognition, everything. So it will learn this. This is the hard part. This is the uh, very deep part of the AI. Actually, five years ago, they said uh, it is close to find AGI soon, but five years passed, but uh, they see it's very hard. So maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, I don't know, but I think we are close, we will find soon because we have very high power energy and uh, processing uh, speeds. Yeah, uh, actually, um, maybe in, it was 1988. I don't, I don't remember the name of the book. I think human behavior with machines or something like that. It, that it was talking about this theory. Uh, they say it says human try to fly every year, every before, but they try to uh, flap uh, his. Uh, arms and they tried to jump over the hills but they couldn't find uh, how to fly but when humanity finds the aerodynamic rules of how uh, airplane flies then they discover the how they can fly with airplane so theory of AI is about the same if we find the aerodynamics of the AI, then we can fly with aerodynamics. Uh, we can fly with the AI. So this is a very good example. It means there can be a way, but not in the same way as we see in here. Uh, can we change? So AI refers to the simulation of human intelligence in machines that are programmed to think like humans, uh, as we said before. The term may be also applied to any machine that exhibits uh, traits associated with the human mind, such as learning and uh, problem solving, maybe in the future reasoning. Reasoning is one of the most part. And AGI is also called strong AI. Uh, it's the kind of subset of AI, core kernel of AI, and it is adaptive to able to develop skills. So you don't need to program, take the, see the camera, get capture the image, uh, apply this method, use this uh, neural network settings like that. You don't need to do this. It, it understands what it do, it develops its skills, and it finds the better solution. Uh, but it's the hard part, as I said before. And there's also artificial biological intelligence, ABI, term that attempts to emulate natural intelligence, like neurons, etc., with the biological way. And Actually, in real, there is no AI yet, and we have AI technologies. All things are AI technologies, while every media says, oh, there is a new AI, there's new AI thing, yeah, but there's no AI. And there is no AGI also uh, still in research. But AGI examples can be AlphaGo Zero, or IBM Watson, maybe GPT-3 also very successful. Jim has uh, good videos about it. Also, I tested GPT-3 with C++ Builder uh, with the REST debugger. Uh, there are good engines, good results, and very uh, big data in there. So uh, 
uh, if you have time, you should try to GPT-3 uh, as soon as possible. And can we pass the next thing? How, may I pass it? No. Uh, this is a simple perceptron model, simple ANN, simple uh, artificial neural network. Uh, we are giving this uh, generally on uh, learnc++.org. Uh, basic idea is there is a weight numbers, we have input and we have output. So uh, what is the output if I give these inputs? What is the output if I give these inputs? We are training like this, this network, and then uh, we find the solution what happens if this uh, input is here. So uh, there is a activation function to calculate this. We are uh, calculating summing all of these uh, numbers uh, and then uh, we find the activation number with the uh, activation function. There are many different activation function examples for different uh, models. And then finally we define the output. Is it one or zero or maybe 1.35? So it detects the mathematical model. Actually, artificial intelligence is something like a multiplication table. Uh, there are numbers and there is an output. Um, can we go next, Jim? Oh, sorry, there we go. So these uh, neural models are very important, I think. For me, I, my area is about this still uh, searching new neural models. And these, um, these technologies actually coming from 1940s. Before the computers were here, there were um, theories and papers. Uh, I don't remember the exact year, maybe uh, 43 or 48. Uh, it's about how neurons should work. So maybe we should change the neural models, maybe we should change our research with the models and neural networks, but we should search. Um, maybe in the 18th or before, we had uh, exact point uh, things. For example, uh, laser uh, doors with lasers. If laser, you put a laser in front of the door, if there's someone, doors is opening and then closing. So you give the coordinate, X and Y, X and Y, uh, there's a person. If there's a person, then open the door. Uh, in that, in that years, we say, wow, it's, it's a very smart door, you know, because it is, it see me and it's opening the door. Wow, very smart. And then we find linear regression also. The linear regression is a, a very old model. Uh, you have many data and you assume that there is, should be a function, linear function. So you can find other data if needed. And moreover, there is a polynomial regression and then Gaussian uh, process regression also. So uh, there are maybe 10, maybe more than uh, 15 different regression types. But in some time, we find that uh, these regressions are not enough to solve these problems. Um, for example, uh, Microsoft has a uh, voice training. You are, you are able to control Windows with the voice recognition. First, you should uh, train it, etc. Uh, they see that artificial neural network, uh, not Microsoft, uh, Google was also very successful now. And artificial neural network is much more successful. For example, if we look at the lower down uh, graphics, there is no solution for this. You cannot, uh, these regression models are not enough to solve this. So this is why we are using AI, why AI is successful. For example, voice is like that. You know, there is no function for the voice. When I say something, when I say A, B, C, so there's a signature like that. So there is no function or regression model for this to understand. 
but AI is able to understand. Uh, this is the why AI is very successful on these kind of image recognition, speech recognition, and other uh, very complex models. And uh, this is the final last graph is from my uh, PhD thesis. It is about energy and exergy analysis of a cogeneration system with the thermodynamic models and with the artificial neural network models I used in, um, we developed here in with C++ Builder. So if you look at the top uh, input energy exergy models, uh, green is the real, uh, real parameters, real values. But the orange one is the AI generated trained values. So this is how AI works. It is exactly um, fitting the about the same graphic. So with the lower data, lower neural models. So this is why AI is important to analyze this kind of thing. Next, Jimmy. May oh, I pass? Sorry, there you go. It's up. So we have a lot of data, a lot of neurons. So which programming language is good? Today, maybe 30 years ago, I would say C++ Builder, Pascal, and Fortran is good to solve these kind of problems. But now we have very high speed processing, so we don't understand uh, what is good, what's bad. And so we have a not much that data if we don't have much data. All programming languages are able to solve. Python is very popular nowadays because of its modules for the artificial intelligence and the support by the Google. Um, but know that um, its modules are compiled with the C++. So if you need a very specific model, you should maybe uh, try to more specific languages like C++, Delphi, C++ Builder, Delphi, maybe Fortran, because native programming languages are faster than other programming languages. Uh, when you need, for example, if you are analyzing an image, all programming languages can be helpful for you. But if you want to analyze an image in drone in 30 per seconds, maybe 60 per seconds uh, with the FPS frame, uh, so you need a speed. You should use your uh, CPU very um, effectively. So this time, these Delphi, C++ Builder, and other uh, native programming languages are important. So I will point out that uh, TensorFlow and Keras, which are both Python specific, actually Torch as well. Um, we have, uh, there are Delphi bindings for that, which I'm gonna show some of those here shortly as well. But uh, this is a good overview of a number of the big libraries that are available out there. TensorFlow is, it was on that slide previously, is a free and open source library for machine learning and artificial intelligence. It is developed by Google Big Brain. That's what Google uses for uh, their internally, and then they also make it available to us. I expect that the internal one is the, development, the, the next version, the version we don't have yet is the one Google use internally. But um, it's mainly used via Python, but there are C bindings. And if there are C bindings, then you can use it from a native compiled tool like Delphi or C++ Builder. Um, now, if you're not, since most people, have, a few people are using Python, but most people are using Delphi, the, the way Python works is the Python language is kind of a glue language that is used to connect to different uh, Python libraries, Python modules. Those Python modules are usually developed in C, C++, or some other native compiled uh, uh, language because they're compiled down for maximum performance. And so once you understand that, then you realize thanks to libraries like Python for Delphi, and or just straight up connecting straight to the C, C bindings, you can connect to these libraries directly and not use Python with any programming language. It's just Python is really popular in the machine learning space. Honestly, if you're not familiar with Python, it pays, it's useful to be familiar with Python because that's where a lot of the machine learning stuff's happening. But 
uh, it's good to know that we have this, you know, tool belt that lets us use it from different languages. So TensorFlow Lite is, I have some examples here to show TensorFlow Lite, is a um, lightweight version of TensorFlow for um, low power devices. You could do these bindings with full TensorFlow as well, but they happen to be with TensorFlow Lite. So I'm gonna have a few examples here, which you can uh, get them out here on GitHub. You can get all these examples I'm about to show you. This GitHub repository is a collection of examples connecting to using TensorFlow Lite. Uh, made a few changes to one we found elsewhere here, and we show you that here now. Uh, we'll start with the digit classifier. So the way this works is you draw a digit here, so we'll try a one, and it will then classify that, giving you ranking here for what it thinks it is. Now, for some reason, my fours occasionally has no idea. Well, it worked that time, 100%. For the longest time, my fours were, it was like, I have no idea what you're doing. It's like, is it a one? Is it a seven? Um, you can choose different models here, which can make subtle changes to what the uh, detection is. Again, that, let's see if I can get a four that doesn't understand. There we go. That one thinks it's an eight. I don't know why. Okay, nine. I can see nine. Um, I have terrible handwriting, so we'll blame that. Okay, so... Model 3 says it's a 4. Model 2 thinks it's a 1 or an 8, interestingly. I did add the ability you can actually come in and make little corrections as you want to erase part of it. No, nope, still thinks it's a... Uh, anyway, so the recognize button, it recognizes automatically when you make a change, and that's the digit classifier. This would be more useful if it had more um, digits would recognize, like letters as well. In here, the, this is where it loads the TF Lite DLL. And then here's the imports it has for it. So if you wanted to reuse this in your other applica another application, you could grab these imports. And then this is the recognize recognizer routine here. And here's where it selects the, the model. And uh, yeah. All right, let's take a look at the face detection. So this is face detection as opposed to face recognition. So the first stage in recognizing somebody's face is detecting the face in the image. So detect says that there's a face right there into this folder here of images and it will detect faces in these. It is hard coded right now to only use a 300 by 300 pixel image. So it doesn't, some of these I would think it would detect, but it doesn't, like for example, this one, the faces are too small, it's not able to detect new faces there. And just in case you're curious, it can tell the difference between me and my dog as well. I don't think it can find me behind the rabbit, let's see. Oh, it can, it found me behind the rabbit tears. A uh, few other ones here, this one, it doesn't detect where, well, uh, let's see. This guy here has got sunglasses on, and we detect, and we see it's not as confident, but it was able to detect a face there. Again, if we look at the code, uh, I will point out this one is hard-coded to 300 by 300 images. I tried to change that, but discovered it was hard-coded in a number of places, and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm not going to change it. Maybe I'll revisit this later. But here is the... Um, I thought I refactored the detection routine out of button to click, but I didn't. So right now the detection routine is in button to click. And there is the code where it's doing the detection. And here are all the imports up at the top. And last but not least, let's check out object detection. This one detects objects in an image. And right now we detect, it says that's an elephant and that's a horse. So clearly was mistaken there, that is not a horse, that was two elephants. Uh, bird, vase, a bottle, orange, and we can also open up um, 
here we go, dog person. And let's see, let's see what it does on this one. That's it, might be interesting. Person, that detected it was a person, but just couldn't find her face in the other one. I don't know why I keep switching back. Oops. Let's see. So it detected one person in that image there. Anyway, and again, I'll take a look at the code real quick. Here is the imports up at the top. And there is a, a detect routine here, where again, it's hard coded to 300 by 300 pixels. And there's the rest of the detection in there. I didn't notice that. Does it have it has a so on all three of these the uh, light the uh, TensorFlow Light DLL is in the folder with the executable, and then there's a label map. Interesting. So these are all the possible things it can discover. I didn't dig into that more. That's, this is the one sample I didn't dig into as much. Um, interesting. I wonder what happened if you change that. If you go out and read the TensorFlow documentation for more information, I'm sure you'll learn way more about this than I have, but just wanted to show that you can take advantage of these from Delphi and potentially C++ Builder. This example is in Delphi, but you could do it from C++ Builder as well because they're C++ APIs. All the, I, the, the blog post link I put in there, I put in the chat a few times, will have all these links available on it as well. So um, I, I can't put all the links in here as we go, unfortunately. So there's also OpenCV. And I have a whole bunch of these that I just couldn't cover all of them today. So they'll all be linked to from the blog post. So you can go check that out. At, to the GitHub repositories and stuff and such. So, uh, so OpenCV is yeah, another one. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, Open the Delphi OpenCV it also has FFmpeg. Uh, OpenCV is Open Computer Vision. It's a a great library for uh, doing computer vision, object recognition, and stuff like that. And then FFmpeg does uh, video processing. Uh, Oh, there's also, I don't have the slide for this. There's also the Keras, Delphi, Keras for Delphi, which also has NumPy for Delphi as well. So those are, those will be on the blog post. I uh, also want to do a shout out for Midtop Software's Intelligence Lab, which is uh, a great pure Delphi solution. If you want to use that, um, check that out as well. And of course, lots of REST APIs. The, um, we've previously done sessions on GPT-3 and IBM Watson. API layer also has machine learning. So here's some examples of some of the API layer uh, APIs for machine learning. Have you, you worked with these, Yilmaz? Yes, uh, I test GPT-3 with uh, API. It works very well. Yeah. In um, C++ Builder, it works. And also you test uh, in Delphi, GPT-3. And yeah. API layer had a, I had an example, I think, in Learn C++ Builder. There are also uh, REST examples oh, yeah. and RESTful examples there. Yeah, I'll put the link there. If you, it is very easy to connect. Also, there is a REST debugger. You don't need to code. You don't need to write anything. You open the REST debugger from tools, and then you put the data about the REST server and then you parameters and then you connect very easy you can test uh, if you are able to uh, connect to gpt3 or any other api api layer or other api tools errors uh, so if you're not familiar uh, amazon web services there we have a new api uh, aperture uh, library that's part of a Red Studio. It's available in Git. It It has a uh, support for PolySpeak. Thanks the term for it. It's a new, it's a text to speech engine that Amazon offers that was just added, I think yesterday. So if you don't have the latest version, go download the latest version from Git. It. 
And then there's uh, I have links at the end that to GPT-3 and IBM Watch is actually pretty tough. This is this is exciting stuff, and a couple people will mention this: the idea that uh, using AI to make us code better, code faster, code more AIs, AIs coding AIs, um, as well as uh, yeah. So interesting stuff here. Uh, unfortunately, it is top of the hour, so I'm going to kind of skim through some of this here. I apologize, you'll mess. Uh, like you said, it's all about okay. it's all about data. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He says all about the data. Should be data. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is. I didn't talk about this as much as I'd like to. This is a huge area of that needs a lot of attention. Is just the uh, ethics of AI, and it's one of those things that we keep discovering because computers are so fast. So really, the interesting thing about AIs is that you can uh, turn them loose on a large amount of data and they can process a lot of data. And then once they do that, then the mistakes, the flaws, the issues with the model become more apparent. And so uh, it's always uncovering new things. And so it, we're, it's, it's a moving target, this idea of how to have ethical AI, right? We think we have it figured out and then we do something and it's like, oh, wait, hold on. That was wrong. We had some bad data in there. We didn't do things right. And so it's constantly feedback, constantly trying to evolve and improve that. So very, very uh, important. And then I always thought this is so cool that you included this singularity is an interesting topic. And this is, uh, you know, a gravitational singularity is a black hole, a mathematical singularity or a singularity in AI is when AI, right, I guess, reaches parity with human, humanity, and we kind of merge with it, I guess, is the idea. Into all intelligence merges together. Um, I think, in my opinion, the, the, uh, if we tried to stop the progress of AI now, we couldn't. <laughs> uh, it, the cat's out of the bag, as it were. The genie's out of the bottle. And, our best bet is to just be as involved as we can in it and help to make sure it is ethical. It is um, – uh, yeah, you just be involved in it and help to make sure that it is uh, going well moving forward. So Sebastian just said the end of humanity. I could, I could get, again, talk about this all day. Just this one slide, but the reality is, if you look at we think what we think about as humanity is we we continue to evolve as humans, right? Humans today are different than humans were many years ago in many different ways, and so in one regard, you might consider AI to be the next evolution of humanity. Right. There are offspring, there are progeny. So it's not so much the end of humanity, but the evolution of humanity. But anyway, I'm I'm uh, also I'm uh, reading I'm a Strange Loop right now, which is a phenomenal book. If you haven't read it, I really <laughs> recommend it. That's all about uh, origins of consciousness and stuff like that. So, again, I can go off all day. <laughs> uh, if but you want to get. Your brain wrapped around this. Here's some good uh, AI movies and series. I'm sorry, were you going to say something about the singularity, Yomas? Uh, I am at the side of mathematical singularity side because if you look at the one division X, if X is zero, it is undefined. So it depends on the where you come from. If you come from the positive side, a limit, then you go up. Uh, positive uh, infinity and if you limit from the negative uh, side then you down it is negative infinity so uh, we should say it is undefined yeah a singularity is undefined now maybe uh, we will uh, reach good things but which uh, function we are in there which uh, things we will have we don't know 
maybe both sides will be happen. Maybe. Yeah, very complex. <laughs> like I said, the best thing to do about it is to be involved and help to uh, shape the future. The, what is it? The the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Totally agree. So if you want to get your AI, uh, wrap your head into AI some more, there's some great things. Uh, 2001 Space Odyssey from 1968, even though it's from 1968, is still such a good example of uh, well-intentioned AI and unintended it, consequences. And it may seem like a bad idea, it, but it is maybe. really accurate. Yeah. Um, I really liked Artificial Intelligence and Her as well. I definitely recommend those if you haven't seen those. Um, and then here's some more recent films. Uh, Coded Bias is a documentary. It's on Netflix. It might be available elsewhere. I highly yeah. recommend that. That's a really good one. Look at the um, ethics uh, side. Ethics. About the ethics. Yes. Yeah. Yep. It's one of the concerns there. Really, really good one there. Um, Alpha Goes, another documentary. Um, it's available. Actually, I have a link for it. It's all on YouTube as well for free, or it's on Netflix. Um, and another one, some good movies that I've enjoyed. I wasn't familiar with. Eva or the Diving Bell and the Butterflies. I'll have to check those out. I uh, I highly co recommend the, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Actually, it is not about the uh, AI. It is about to uh, paralyze the person. But uh, when I watch it, I um, think about the AI, how AI should interact with uh, things, you know. So maybe uh, I like it because I put it there because it gives me more ideas. In it save you can do with one input and output with everything maybe like that yeah okay um i have links to this go check this out if you haven't seen this open ai is multi-agent hide and seek this is another great example of how um unintended consequences how ai how you can have you can create a uh, exercise for AI to do and AI can surprise you by discovering new things that you didn't think were possible uh, and again that's because it's able to just try and try and try and try and try again in this case it's adversarial because there were two AIs that were training each other all right so uh, QA I, I will put all the links up here here's a bunch of links here that will be on the YouTube as well as all the link or no, I'm sorry that will be on the blog post, which I put in there as well. All the slides, all the, everything else will be available on the blog post. So check that out. Uh, Ian commented that uh, if I ask Gilmaz a question about math, I shouldn't do that because he's really a mathematical computing robot genius that only and only Stephen Hawking can understand him. <laughs> Unfortunately, Stephen you, Hawking's passed away, no, so it's just, no, it just feel bad no. about. <laughs> on the engineering side, maybe not. Uh, high, yeah. Uh, when you talk about AI as evolution of us as humans, do you think of extensions like smartphones and implants? What direction do you think? So actually, yes, I would say that a smartphone is a cybernetic enhancement for humans. So, for example, I have glasses that I wear. This is this is a form of cybernetics, right? <clears throat> the reality is today we are already, we're all hot cyborgs, right? Whatever the case is, anytime we're using technology to extend, expand or extend our own uh, abilities, that makes us cyber cyborgs. And so when you look at things like Neuralink and other things like that, right? The, I don't know about you, but man, if I don't have my smartphone, I just can't function anymore, you know? Or whatever the case may be, maybe it's, maybe it's your tea or your coffee, right? That makes you a cyborg. I don't. I don't know my wife's phone number. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's all. Yeah, it's he... all in our smartphones. It's all in our smartphones. And so, while right now we have this very primitive, crude interface, right, where we interface with it. You know, yes, we can use uh, voice recognition. Yes, we can use. You know, it can uh, op recognize things optically. But as we expand that, right, with better, higher bandwidth communication between us and electronic devices, between us and our cybernetic enhancements, we're going to see an evolution of what it means to be human. Continue to see it. Also, our body is getting closer to the technology every year. 
first it was in the office you uh, if you want to communicate with uh, someone you should go to uh, phone dialing uh, cabinet or something uh, to talk with someone so it was very far and then we find uh, uh, we put the cell phones into our home and business then into our uh, pockets and now glasses maybe brain yeah come in. Uh, someone asked about, uh, suggested Johnny Mnemonic, because that was a great movie, agreed. There's a lot of movies out there. Um, I, uh, I, I really like, the, some of the movies that were on there were good ones that really kind of changed the way you think about things. But, um, oh gosh, there's a number of books. I need to, I really need to put, like, some of the books I've been reading related to this up there on the blog post. Maybe I'll do that. Um, Yen says, a voice recognition is only an improvement for our poor vision displays are so small. Yes, yep. And, and, and you know, the thing is, a really interesting thing, um, so I had that graph earlier that was the uh, hype or a hype cycle for emerging technologies, what that is by Gartner, and they plot things on that. And so there's this uh, emerging side here, and then there's this peak of inflated expectations at the top. And so that's where you hear all the time about like NFTs today, right? Everyone's like, ah, NFTs, NFTs, or AI, AI, right? And you're like, I don't know what it is, but it's exciting. And so then what happens is we have all these incredible expectations on something, but then it drops down into this trough of disillusionment. And um, then it comes back out in the plateau of productivity. And the interesting thing with that is, is um, the idea of computers being able to understand your voice, right? Speech recognition used to be, oh, that's crazy. I mean, I remember, you know, like, oh, we got to, you know, try and get this. And it wasn't, it was, all of it was terrible, right? There was a lot of software out there, but it was all terrible. We were all excited about it. And then we kind of, you know, it, 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 it faded away. It went into that trough of disillusionment. But now it's, a pretty standard thing. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's getting better all the time. And uh, so that's what we're going to see. We see a lot of that, right? Where things were like, oh, this was a big deal, but then it faded away. But now we have this. And it's totally unrelated. Nope, that's the same thing. It's just gone through that uh, trough and come out the other side. It's something we don't recognize. Um, yeah. So Dieter's asking, was OCR developed with AI logic or with standard algorithm? Um uh, it has uh, now AI logic things, um, RNN or LSTM, uh, I don't know, but they are using, uh, I think, LSTM, the handwriting recognition and other recognitions, it's very good. LSTM is used uh, generally. Maybe they are using, I don't know, uh, their technology now. It depends on the company or the codes inside, I don't know. Yeah. Um, originally, it was standard, um, but the reality is, is that's kind of a artificial distinction we're making because anytime, anytime you're a computer is doing something that is a type of uh, intelligence, if you will, uh, understanding that is artificial intelligence, and so even if you're doing a standard algorithm that's not a neural network, it still could be artificial intelligence. So it's, it wasn't originally neural networks, but now it is using neural networks. Uh, we're t past top of the hour, uh, so I, we'll wrap up here pretty quick, but I want to try and talk some about some of these questions. Um, NVIDIA GTC has just been held, and there were a lot of NVIDIA SDKs, such as Rivia and Maxine. Um, have you considered using Delphi to make some SDKs? Um, yeah, I watched the video. Nvidia, yeah, very nice. Oh, I need to check that one out. I, actually, I did hear some of the news that came out of that, but not all of it. There's that. That's one thing today. There is so much news and events and uh, things that are uh, innovations happening. It's just impossible to keep track of. It. <laughs> yeah.
Anything uh, you last that you wanted? Is there something you want to go back that I skimmed over that you wanted to go back to? Because we can do that. Or if there's other comments you have, I appreciate your time and you being part of this. But uh, thank yeah. you, thank you, Jim. Okay. So uh, Yilmaz has a lot of great. So I will um, I will send you a link Yilmaz for the blog post that goes with this, and you can go and yeah. add other uh, things in there because I know you have a lot of great content out on like Learn C++ and yeah. uh, they cover a lot of these topics as well. Uh, again, it's one of those things that yeah. just so much. I, to cover. I try to put very low codes which can be run with um, IOTS or uh, any other C and C++ based uh, operating systems, maybe Linux, maybe Apple, uh, any uh, operating system, macOS, uh, you can compile these uh, C++ uh, examples. Very basic, you can improve them. Very nice. There is an artificial technology category. You can find a lot of examples there. Yeah. And we are keep adding new, more complex things maybe soon. I don't know. All right. So I put the link. It should be, I don't know which direction it's going to be, but at the bottom of the screen, it says blogs.marketarrow137. Uh, that should be, I'm not sure that's right. Actually, now that I had the trouble with it. Yep, that's right. Okay. So if you go to this page here, it will be updated later with uh, all the slides and all the links from the presentation. And I will also, like I said, I'll make sure Yilmaz has that so you can go and add other stuff to it as well. So awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Yilmaz, for sharing your expertise and uh, with me as Thank well. You. I appreciate that. You have uh, very colorful neurons, very colorful brain <laughs> as you have now. Thank you very much. I, I did a uh, I did a presentation at the uh, our local library for uh, for kids on this, and they all wanted to come up and wear the headset and see their brains. And that I mean, think about that. That is literally mind blowing to say I can look and see what's happening in my brain in real time. Now, mm -hmm. someone commented that it's action potentials going through the skull and stuff like that. Yes, technically it is. There are Things are happening there; they're getting in the way. Yeah, but it it's is, nothing. yeah, it's so amazing. And that's the the. So here's something that's interesting in the ethics department. Sorry, I've got off the deep end again. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of debate going on right now for at what point does a neural network have some level of consciousness that it, we have ethics about turning it off. Now, you might think, oh, it's digital, it doesn't have, it can't have a soul. So here's the interesting thing. So first of all, uh, I'm a strange loop, gets into this a lot as well, the idea of souls and consciousness. But um, they're also building artificial neural networks with actual brain neurons. So they're building biological neurons and wiring them up in Petri dishes to do tasks like we're mm -hmm. studying in AI. So they're building these biologically. So is there some point when you have so many connections within that Petri dish that that Petri dish has some, could have some consciousness, some level of rights, right? Like a minority report, there were three uh, girls, yeah, they were yeah. used their brains were yeah exactly and so but, yeah but well, yeah. It, is, it it has a limit uh, but if we go on computers there's no limit <laughs> yeah it's just, it's just such an interesting world we live in um so much so much happening and so much changing and i love your concept about aerodynamics by the way your, your slide about that because that's something i think about a lot is what what are the things that we're not thinking about, right? That once we understand, it will just change the way we see things. Because today, you know, you're in school and you learn how a wing works and how aerodynamics works. And you're like, oh, it's easy. Why didn't they figure out flying years ago? Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so who knows? Who knows? Our, our grandkids are going to learn 
some basics in school and they'll be like, why did my grandpa not know how to do this? This is so simple. And they're going to be, you know, six years old. And <laughs> anyway, all right. Appreciate everybody. Thank you for being part of this. Um, yeah. Petri dishes like analog computers, digital ones. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, do stay tuned. Uh, Blogs.embarcadero.com. And then also the Embarcadero events page will have uh more webinars coming. We have a whole new series we're working on right now. So you can uh, find that out there, but stay attention to your e email box. Uh, email, let's see, resources, events page, right there. We'll have more uh, more webinars coming soon here. I can't believe the page is so slim. I have a whole series of them that should be going up on here shortly. So, all right, stay tuned. See you later. Thanks a lot, Yilmaz. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Nice. Bye. Bye. Bye.